Hello and welcome to The Other Marthas, the show where a drama student and a film graduate try to make sense of things we wish we were qualified in instead, with emphasis on history, mystery and all things morbid. A quick disclaimer before we get started, we don't claim to be experts in any of the things we'll be talking about, so while everything we say will be based on individual research, it's just a bit of fun and we suggest that you take everything we say with a pinch of salt. I'm Martha, I'm the drama student. And I'm The Other Martha, the film graduate. So Martha, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, Martha, today we're going to be talking about Operation Mincemeat, the greatest deception of World War II. And I have to say, the most fun I've had researching something, including just about Everest. So this has been quite the morning for me. I am so excited to hear what, I, what I think... that even means. Why is it called Operation Mincemeat? I know. Uh, you're you're going to love this because it's all about espionage. Um, it's all about like bodies and... It's just great. You can okay. <laughs> love it. Um, okay. I, I don't like the profile of me being your lover because it's about <laughs> bodies and espionage. Yeah, but in the way that, I mean, I also loved it. And this okay. is our podcast. Well, that's all right, now. We've, I think we've revealed ourselves as what we I are. I won't sue you for defamation of character. Fabulous. Right. Now, um, I, I want to say this in advance. The first bit of what I've written, um, because I've based most of what I've written on a documentary. Um, I have it in my head as like a little narrative with spooky music underneath. So just like, don't interrupt for the first bit because it's all, uh, na -ma -na -ma -na -ma -na -ma. and then you'll see when I start talking like a regular person then. Okay, can you, can you tell, can you like give me a signal when I'm allowed to start interrupting? Cause I, I will, will be bottling it up. Yes. And the second thing is, I just want to let our listeners know ah, yes. about the cake situation. <laughs> It's my brother's birthday. Operation Cupcake. Soon. And it's not a cupcake. I'm baking him a proper cake. I'm baking him a lemon cake. It's in the oven. So <laughs> I just want to let the viewers know the stress I'm under. <laughs> because time management is one of the many things in which we are not qualified. I'm actually great at time management. Yeah, she is. I've had a very busy morning. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Whereas I, to be fair, you talk about time management. I've had a week to research this and I've done it all today. So... <laughs> Operation Mincemeat. And where better to start than at the beginning of the end? On April the 30th, 1943, at 9.30am, a young Spanish fisherman, Jose Antonio Rey Maria, is out on his boat, he's just off the coast of Huelva, when he sees a body floating in the water. <gasps> Upon closer inspection, he can see that the body is wearing a British naval uniform and a life jacket, and it's strapped to a briefcase. Clearly, the briefcase is not intended to stray from this person. He brings the body ashore, where two Spanish doctors conduct a brief autopsy, aided by the British consul in Spain. The body is identified as Major William Martin of the British Royal Marines, and he is declared to have died by accidental drowning. Upon his person are found various letters, receipts, ticket stubs, etc., confirming his identity. The briefcase, however, is sent into storage unopened. This mysterious apparition has not gone unnoticed, however, by Spanish Nazi intelligence, and suspicion is further aroused when multiple telegrams are intercepted between Britain and the British naval attaché in Spain, demanding that a small black briefcase which has gone astray be located immediately, lest it fall into the wrong hands. Inevitably, the briefcase does find its way into Nazi custody within a few days, and they photograph its contents before replacing it exactly as before and returning it to the Spanish authorities before anything is declared amiss. Inside the briefcase, they find a private letter from General Sir Archibald Nye to General, Har General Harold Alexander, the British commander in North Africa, heavily implying that the imminent Allied invasion of Southern Europe, which the Nazis had suspected for some time, was going to take place in Greece. The intelligence is meticulously examined, confirmed and sent up the echelons of command until it reaches Adolf Hitler, who quickly deploys an enormous amount of his military power to Greece to await the attack. On the morning of July 10th, 160,000 Allied troops storm the beaches of the relatively unprotected Sicily and take it over in just over a month, swaying the tide of World War II for good, while thousands of German forces wait in Greece for an invasion that never comes. Meanwhile, in a tiny basement from beneath the Admiralty in London, Flight Lieutenant Charles... Jesus Christ. Flight Lieutenant Charles Chumley and Royal Navy Lieutenant Commander Ewan Montagu drink a triumphant toast to Glinda Michael, a penniless Welshman who has taken his own life with rat poison, friendless and homeless, on 24th of January 1943, unaware of the part he would play in the greatest deception of World War II. 
Operation Mincemeat. <sighs> now you can say things before I continue if you want to. I'm so excited. I know. Wow. It's just, oh. So, can I ask a question that's going to make me sound really stupid? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> In fact, you encourage those sorts of questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, by Spanish Nazis, yes, are they like what? What was the situation in Spain with the Nazis? Okay, so um, Spain was technically neutral, but their dictator, um, I think it was Franco. Yeah, General Franco who was the dictator at the time, basically turned a blind eye to Nazi spy presences. Um, okay. I don't know whether they were German or Spanish, but either way... They right, were. okay, so they could be Germans in Spain that were Nazis, yeah. or it could be Spanish, Spanish people in Spain that were Nazis. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was really my only question. Everything else, pretty, pretty, pretty standard. <laughs> I can get behind that. I'm not going <laughs> to ask any other questions that are related to the mystery because it seems like that's what you're going to tell me that is exactly Actually, what I'm if i was go like into. so who is this corpse <laughs> yeah. like, well mother weirdly i don't know but you'd love to know uh or or you're like no that's it that's the story ask as yeah. many questions you want because i'm not telling you anything else you worked for the government that would be a plot twist and a half and it would be really fun for me but i think it would be just incredibly irritating for everyone else um luckily it's not the case so Let's wind back. The first thing to know is that Major William Martin of the British Royal Marines never existed, and nor did the Allied plan to invade Greece. <gasps> if you know your history, you probably already know that, because we didn't invade Greece, we invaded Sicily. Um, I wouldn't have known that. But there we are. Yes. Is um, William, mm -hmm. is he the corpse? He is the corpse. Good to know. Yes. Um, so the problem was everyone knew the allies were gonna invade the nazi territories in southern europe at some point soon and sicily was the really blindingly obvious point from which um we were gonna take them so the germans were well aware of this they weren't stupid they've been amassing their defenses in sicily for quite a while and at the rate that we were going the invasion was predicted to be very long and very bloody um they thought at this point this was like around january that the allies were gonna take about ten thousand casualties in the first week um, and that they would lose around 300 of their naval ships in the first two days. Um, so Whoa. it was looking to be quite devastating. So some urgent lateral thinking was needed in order to take Sicily without massive, massive loss of life. Um, and this is where the plan came in. It began with an idea and a list of 51 suggestions from none other than Ian Fleming, who then went on to write the James Bond novels. Um, he was a young intelligence officer at the time and uh, three years prior, so 1940, I guess, um, he'd written this list and this particular idea was entitled a suggestion brackets not a very nice one um, basically the suggestion was that a corpse could be dressed in airman uniform and dropped on a coast with fake documents on it um, planted so that it would fall into enemy hands um, and initially it was kind of thought of as a very outlandish and macabre scheme but it is the kind of thing that they could actually employ in this situation. Um, yeah, well also, like mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, would they have to kill someone? No, it's a lot of the Second World War. There are corpses everywhere. Everywhere, exactly. Um, so if this scheme could be used to persuade the Germans that the British weren't going to invade Sicily, it could really turn the tide of the war. So we thought they'd give it a go. Uh, the two agents chosen to set the plan to action were Charles Chumley, Every now and then I'm going to stumble over the word Chumley, which you wouldn't think I would, but it's because it's, it's spelt C-H-O-L-M-O-N-D-L-E-Y. So it's spelt Cholmondley. But it's called Why Chumley. didn't you just spell it Chumley? <gasps> oh, I'm That's an idiot. It's a podcast. I just spell it phonetically. Well, partly out of respect for him, because apparently every time he was introduced to someone, he was this massively tall man with a slick moustache, and he'd be like, the name's Chumley, C-H-O-L-M-N-D, and like spell it out like an idiot um so that's the kind of man he was he was an okay. raf officer turned mi5 agent um and the other guy was called ewan montague he was a naval officer who was quickly snapped up for the intelligence services when his background as a barrister was revealed um 
as a barrister, obviously kind of your job is to reveal deception and so you're going to be great in the intelligence services. Sorry, I keep forgetting the context because I'm like, wait a minute, so <laughs> he joined the army, no, no, <laughs> I'm not that stupid. He joined the army, because mm. in my mind I was like, he joined the army, then they, they found out he used to be a lawyer basically and then they were like, oh let's let us recruit him no yeah. it's the second world war corpses everywhere they're desperate yes yeah they are desperate um so neither of these people despite the fact that they were both lieutenants in their respective fields neither of them either went to sea or up in the air they just immediately were snapped up yes i also want to make a quick point about chumley mm. I know it probably wouldn't do a lot to help you, but you know how like spies generally have like other identities? Yeah. If you have a name that's really hard to spell and when you look at it, it doesn't spell like how it's said, mm. wouldn't you like make a point of being kind of confusing about that? Because then they'd be like, oh, um, when they like, I don't know, they find a list of everyone that works mm. for the company. Everybody look out for Cholmondy and he'll be like, oh, that Cholmondy guy sounds real fishy, not like me, yeah. you chummy chumly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. Yes. I, I don't know that it would make a lot of difference, but it might make some of a difference. I don't know, I guess he, he was more into renown than life. I don't know. Um, That's n that, that does not make a good spy generally. True. True. <laughs> they should have just let him go up in a plane. Um, actually, no, because this worked really well. But anyway, um, <laughs> we'll so these guys, yeah, <laughs> these guys are in charge of um, Operation Mincemeat. Um, I'll come on to how it got to be named. <laughs> I will, there's no way I can say it without being weirdly sexual. How do I, I will get on to, that's what I'm trying to say, I will get on to how it became known as Operation Mincemeat presently. Great. No. What What do you mean weirdly sexual? What are you going on about? Because I tried to say I will come on to and you made a what oh, expression and no. then I was going to change it to I will enter into and that sounded weird. Well. I will get on to. I didn't make an expression about you. My pen threw, my pencil flew at my face. Ah, okay. oh, you jumped to a conclusion. Um, you jumped to the conclusion that I thought you were being too sexy for me. I mean, it's a conclusion I'd generally jump to. So both of these men worked with Section 17M of the Intelligence Services, which spent its time gathering and analysing enemy intelligence, as you would expect. So their first task was to find an appropriate corpse. So it had to be of the right kind of age bracket that would be um, fighting at the time, um, and which had died in a way which would appear consistent with drowning or falling from an aircraft. So although, as you pointed out, there was an abundant supply of corpses just around during the Second World if War. They were shot. Yeah, most of them were shot or, um, you know, buried in detritus from a falling building. And it was quite clear that they weren't, um, they hadn't died at sea. So to help them with this, they enlist the help of someone that I think you will love and should look up. His name is Sir Bentley Purchase. Um, and he's the coroner of St Pancras. I don't know an awful lot about him, um, but supposedly he found everything about death just really funny. Um, <laughs> me! <laughs> exactly. Um, and when he uh, found an appropriate corpse for them, which I'll get onto, he gave uh, Montague really, really complex directions to get to the mortuary where he was. Um, and then at the end of the phone call, he said, alternatively, of course, another way to get here is you could get run over and just had a little chuckle to himself. And Montague was like, not, not helpful, but thanks, Sir Bentley Montague. Bentley Montague's a Bentley purchase. Anyway, Sir Bentley keeps an eye <laughs> on the bodies coming in for any that might kind of fit the bill. And he pounces when he comes across the body of Glindor Michael in a disused warehouse near King's Cross. So Glindor Michael, <laughs> you can't stop. Which bit are you laughing at? I'm just loving the alternatively get run over. I know, he's such a... The term that comes to mind is mongoose, but I don't know why. He's just such a cheeky fella. Uh, <laughs> I'm just having a quiet giggle, because that's so funny. Especially <laughs> to say to, like, a spy. You're so just like, alternatively, get run over. I oh. know, and he's like... <laughs> presumably they've called him up and they're like, look, Sir Bentley Purchase you can be a part of the single most important 
espionage mission. Do you think mission. they would have told him that? Or do you think they were just like, hey, uh, well, with the government and we need a corpse that looks I brown. doubt they'd have told him what like, it was. I'm on it. Yeah, but they'd have been like, it's very important that you find a corpse that looks like it might have drowned or fallen. Cool. Anyway, uh, he finds the body of Glinda Michael. Glinda Michael is 34 years old. He's killed himself with rat poison, which uh, will not be traceable in an autopsy. Clearly, things have moved on. Um, Michael's life was quite short and tragic. He was born in the Welsh mining town of... Good God. Uh, Ababagoy? <laughs> Ababagoy? It looks like Ababagoed, but I know that's not how it's pronounced. It's like Ababagoy or something like that. Apologies um, to the Welsh. Um, his father stabbed himself in the throat when Glinda was 15, um, which just seems, apart from anything else, just an unnecessarily horrific... Was he trying to kill himself? He was, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, he decided to he go about it that slip. way. No, yeah, that that's... would be quite something. Surely there are other ways to kill yourself in ways. Yeah, that are less that. just horrifying. Um, but, I don't know. Uh, his mother... Point? Hey? I said choices were made. His choices were made. His mother then died in 1940, and so Glinda drifted to London, sort of faded into oblivion, um, and then very sadly found himself with nothing and killed himself in a disused warehouse with rat poison. Very, very sad, true life. Um, however, this sort of friendless existence, ultimately at the end, was perfect for a fudge death certificate. So, uh, Sir Bentley basically just goes, he died overseas. And then... Um, gives this newly anonymous body over to Montague and Chumley for the imposing of a new post-mortem identity. Yes. Does, um, what's he called, Glendor? Uh, Glindor. Glindor. Glindor, Michael. It's spelt, actually <laughs> it won't help you, it's spelt G-L-Y-N-D-W-R. Glindor is, is... Oh yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, does he have ancestors? Not ones that would care to fight, but why? Because imagine if you were doing your like, oh, I'm doing my ancestry, I'm gonna find out my family history, and like you're going through like, oh, minor, minor, yeah, 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 yeah. oh Welsh. my god, and then they find, point. wait a second, <laughs> one of my ancestors was put in the sea by some spies. That what? would be incredible. I'm pretty sure he, um. He was sort of the last of his line and died oh. childless. Um, unless, of course, he just sort of had dalliances that he wouldn't necessarily have kept a record of. Um, yeah, but if you didn't keep a record, it didn't happen. Yeah. In, in history. In terms. history. Um, unless one of those, <sighs> the results of one of those dalliances then kind of decided to go on, who do you think I am? What is it? Who do you, who do you think you are? <laughs> but my point is, who do no, you think I my am? point is, <laughs> I mean that's that is the show. So my point is is that if he sneaks off, if Glendor sneaks off to a barn and sexes up a woman, <laughs> then Roger's that, the barmaid. And then the woman isn't mm. like, oh, it was Glendor. She's like, oh, it was a travelling man. I don't know. Yeah. Then the baby's not gonna yeah, 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 that's what the I'm birth saying. certificate's not Yeah, but who do you think you are can't time travel? They won't go back to the barn and watch the dalliances. They won't (laughs) know if it's not written down. I thought it was partly based on, like, gene stuff. Is it not? Not not who do you think you are. Oh. No, they just just trace the family. And also, they don't have Glendor's DNA. Okay, so hold... uh... Ah, balls. Well, if they did, if they had taken it, then, you know, if the result of one of his possible hypothetical dalliances committed a crime and they fingerprinted him then maybe they could retrospectively figure that out but basically your fingerprints your dna oh christ i don't know <laughs> you, you don't know you don't seem to know a lot about any of this glindor <laughs> michael glindor. is the last remnant of glindor michael um, oh. and even he was not glindor michael for very long um because i know it's really <laughs> sad um but it, it paved the way for something glorious. So well done, Glindor, for Yeah, it probably saved a lot existed. of lives. Oh, God, yeah. So many. Um, so it's at this point that Major William Martin is born, doomed to die at sea after an air crash, at which point we come to step two of the plan. Put the body on ice, whack it in a freezer, and invent a brand new personality for this Major. So they settle on this kind of heroic, romantic, but very disorganised man, 
I put he's deep in both debt and love, which I was quite proud of. Um, they procure the correct uniform for him um, and Chumley wears it sort of day to day to give it the appropriate wear and tear. And then they go to some lengths uh, to obtain character appropriate underwear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is so relatable. I, <laughs> what? <laughs> because I've done like costume on films and stuff. Oh, right, and right, right, like, right. I was like terrified. What sort of vest would this man wear? Exactly. Like, I've bought the special pants and socks for the men. Well, this is the thing. They couldn't do that because of rationing. And so what they did was they um, they went to uh, Oxford University, where the distinguished historian H.A.L. Fisher had died two years previously. He had been serving as the warden of New College. And uh, they basically stole... Um, his vest, pants and socks because they felt that those were appropriate to someone of the major's rank, I guess. Um, Why didn't they put their own pants on it? Because they only had like a couple of pairs. None of oh, them right, were so they had to find a dead person's pants. To yeah, put that they weren't okay. using them. And then Oxford University had this, you know, pristine room to commemorate this um, eminent historian and they went, <laughs> we'll take his pants. And Oxford went, what? And they wanted us for the government and just took them. Um, okay, <laughs> I, I mean, sure. I, I, I don't know that they needed to go to that much detail, but they did. Um, no, no, they probably did. Because, like, if, if, they, if the Germans had undressed the corpse, or I suppose hmm. the Spanish, I don't know. If they yeah. undressed the corpse... And then they found like rugged Welsh farmer pants on it. They'd be like, "True." What, no, what I mean why is, is they general like, wearing yeah. farmer pants. <laughs> but they could probably have found some pants somewhere that would also have worked, just like regular <laughs> UK pants. But um, <laughs> he had HL Fisher's pants, and there you go, posterity. <laughs> um, <Weird. laughs> they then scoured the streets for a lookalike for the body because they were trying to. They were trying to make an ID photograph. And they kept trying to photograph the corpse, but it just looked too corpsey. Um, like they'd be like, "Oh, let's just prop you up now, Glindor," and it would go, uh, and like the head, yeah, because that's the thing. Or the eyes would pop out, you know. Um, that's the thing that the Victorians did, isn't it? Yeah, it's, post mortem photography, and it they just looked very dead. So instead, they just go around on the streets, going sort of ferreting around looking for people who look a lot like with the a picture of the corpse <laughs> that they've already sorry, taken of sorry. it looking corpsey God, no, God, like, sorry God. i just need to see if you look like a corpse, corpse. i have yeah um and they find someone who luckily is another um intelligence officer so he's just like oh. yeah I, I understand that you might need to take a photo of me um i'm imagining the the spider-man meme where the two spider-mans point at each other yeah. because like to start with they would have been like oh um would you like a photo taken? Like they would have been trying to like not tell them that it was a spy. Yeah. And then he was like, wait, are you guys spies? And they were like, no. no. It was like, like I am and that's fine. I'm a spy. And they're like, oh, we're spies. And like, yay, we're all spies. I like the idea that Chumley and Montague are just kind of trekking around the streets going with the photograph of a corpse, just looking at every passerby. And then they get back to... Um, wherever they are under the admiralty and they kind of slump in their desks and they turn to the person next to them to be like hard day and then they go <laughs> the person next Whoa. to them looks exactly like this corpse anyway we've been looking all day for you <laughs> they uh they find a lookalike for the corpse they take the id photo forward to the military id they then set about creating uh, what they call wallet litter which is um just bits and pieces to authentically um, make it look like a real person so he, they give him bus tickets, they give him ticket stubs from a London play and some more personal items. Some of my favourites I've listed here. So they forge a letter from Martin's bank manager, which is cerned by Ernest Whitley Jones of Lloyd's Bank, um, reminding him about him of his outstanding overdraft of £79, 19 shillings and tuppence. Um, then they also, <laughs> they open a kind of headshot competition for the female intelligence agents uh, to supply him with a girlfriend. So all of the female intelligence officers, they're like, do you guys want to send in nice photographs of you? And then we'll pick one that we think is like in his league and he might have in his wallet. Um, his, his type. Yeah, his type. Uh, we think you'd just fit. Um, and so Jean Leslie, who's a young MI5 secretary, is, is chosen. She supplies uh, a photo, which is just kind of a laughing 
young Leslie in a bathing suit. Ooh, a little bit saucy, Ooh. but generally just quite cute. Um, I would have, um, not to criticise Chumley and Montague, but <laughs> I reckon I probably would have, instead of thinking more of modern um, espionage, mm. but oh my god my cake time is gonna go off but i would have d- gone to like sainsbury's and been like here's a competition for the ladies of sainsbury's because if you're giving a picture of one of your spies to I know. the opposition it's like in fact can two only, of your spies yeah true i can only imagine it was to keep it sort of more quiet again because if you're getting a lot of just public women to submit a photo for a competition it might create some rumpus i guess just any kind of publicity that might get out i I suppose they're trying to avoid um i'll let you go and get your cake at this point and then i'll tell you more yes thank you it just went off i'm gonna go and i'm gonna go and spear it but if it's not ready then we'll have 10 more minutes all right great it wasn't ready okay still thoroughly moist (laughs) and i'm so jealous i'm only gonna get a slice of it uh, we found this uh, delightful photo of Jean Leslie, um, and she, well, her photo now adopts the persona of Pam, the um, girlfriend, ooh, or is it fiance? I'll get to that, um, of Major, whatever his name is or isn't. Um, they then William add. something. Yeah, Martin, there we are. Oh, they then add really? love letters, yep, yeah, between uh, Pam and Bill. Um, as she calls him, and in actual fact, they're written by uh, the head secretary of MI5, who's elderly, stern, and unmarried. She's called Hester Leggett. Um, and these letters, they read like um, film noir voiceovers. They're like, uh, come now, pal, pull your socks up. You must stop crying. Oh, that I could see you once more. They're really OTT, but absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are added as well. Uh, finally, there's a genuine invoice from the eminent jewellers Phillips of Bond Street for an engagement ring costing Ooh. £53, 10 shillings and sixpence. Um, no record of such a ring exists in the shop's accounts, but nowadays uh, a ring like that would be worth around £13,000. So this is a lavish gesture. Um, and according to Nicholas Norton, who is a specialist at Phillips now, um, or was at the time of the documentary I saw, um, the invoice itself is genuine, so possibly the intelligence services still owe Phillips of Bond Street fifty-three or thirteen thousand pounds, but they don't. It's fine. Now here's a weird side note that I find quite alarming, but also very funny. Montague, who had a wife and kids, but they've been evacuated to the U.S. because um, he'd probably be near the top of the Gestapo list. Um, Montague is also oh, right. Jewish, so multiple reasons why he would be up there. Um, he became a bit obsessed with his own creation and he started stepping out with Jean Leslie, whose photo had been used for um, the fictitious Pam. And he would write her letters and sign them Bill. Um, he kept a copy of her photograph on his mantelpiece on which she had written, Till Death Do Us Part, Your Loving Pam. It was really weird. Like he was that having an weird. affair. But as someone else, with someone who didn't exist, but he was still kind of having an affair. Like, really odd stuff um thankfully he was living with his mum at the time and his mum wrote to his wife in america like your husband is being odd he has a a note on his dresser from a woman who doesn't exist please come home so she came home and was like uh stop it montague stop being a tit um did they know though uh oh true actually i because like it's not if the if the reports we have of his weird relationship, like it's weird that it's on the mantelpiece, but maybe he was trying to weather it in a certain way. But like, it was a copy of the photograph. It wasn't the uh, one that, yeah. No, no, that is weird. Okay, so he is being weird, but he's <laughs> not being as weird as they thought. Or is he being weirder? He's being weirder because they because the mother, possibly wouldn't have known that she didn't exist. They'd just be like, yes. oh God, he's into some girl called Pam. That's so not the, right. Yeah, so the mother would have been like, I think he's cheating on you. But yeah. what he's actually doing is he's pretending to be someone else, dating a woman who doesn't exist, <laughs> who is a real woman at his job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And because both of the people playing the fake parts are real, he is still kind of having an affair. But is he? Because if you're writing, if 
Okay, well, so he it's weird that's weird because yeah. he's writing letters in character to a mm. woman who's re replying in character but obviously they're having fun with it yeah so this is the thing none of the like the letters were in character but none of them were at any point supposed to be used as part of the deception it was just for them um and also they <laughs> would i know they would go dancing into the movies and stuff so it was okay so he was cheating yeah he was her. in the same way that um like if I, I was gonna say if I had a boyfriend, I do. So let's say um, if I, having a boyfriend as I do, um, said, ah, it started flirting with someone and introduced myself as Petunia and said, you are Harold. Um, and they was like, no, 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 I'm not cheating on you, darling. Um, it's Harold and Petunia, I would still be doing it. But what if you were in a play well, that's completely with that person. Oh, I see. No, no, and you were playing the character of someone's partner. Yeah. And so you would like message them in character. To like, and help they get into message. character. I feel like, yeah. firstly, that would potentially be a bit weird, but I feel like it's something that you could explain, and as long as it was all on the same understanding, could be. And you weren't like <laughs> sending them nudes and things. Exactly, exactly. Um, but this, I, I feel like it would have been different if Montague and Jean Leslie had been obliged to actually play those parts, but they weren't at all. Um, yes, no, it is really weird. Odd. It's weird. I'm not saying it's not weird. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how weird it is. It's it's pretty much as weird as it could be. I think in the situation, it's pretending yeah. to be a dead man who doesn't exist. Yeah, that is weird. <laughs> Anyway, so he had imagine his if he imagine if he ruined the trick because he wrote a love letter as the guy bef like so Bill's meant to be dead at this point mm. but he continues to write the letters yeah. and the Germans <laughs> pick it up and they're like wait a minute this guy's meant to be dead that would be I mean it would be incredibly tragic but also hilarious um, <laughs> thankfully really that didn't happen um, because his wife came back and went stop it you moron um, so. Okay. By now, um, it's April, and the planned invasion of Sicily uh, is only weeks away. The Germans are heavily reinforcing the island, and it is time to act. And so they add the final puzzle piece, um, which is the top secret letter um, for which all of the other smaller letters and bits and pieces have been added for credibility. So this is a letter between two officials implying that the attack on Sicily is just going to be a small distraction, a kind of smokescreen, for the major big time invasion in Greece and also Sardinia. Um, so they write draft after draft of this letter trying to make it as authentic as possible. And in the end, they decide to adopt a failsafe strategy and they uh, get General Sir Archibald Nye himself to write this letter. Um, yeah. Which you'd think they would have arrived at earlier as a conclusion, but maybe they again were trying to get as, as few people involved as possible. Um, although this guy is a general in the army that you're trying to win the war for it's probably okay anyway it's probably um, okay if he's so he he boy. writes it to my dear alex and he signs it yours ever archie nye it's very I you know, know officers this is this is the same vibe as when they get news reporters in <gasps> films and do a news report you're so right i love it when they do that it's my my favourite is when the news reporters aren't very good at doing fake news reports. It's like, just read it in the same way as you would any other report. Yeah. But they're like, like oh, but I'm job. acting. Like, as yourself. Yeah. But, yeah, I just love that. I, th I yeah, think they do too. it in Shaun of the Dead, don't they? Um, I I've actually not seen Shaun of the Dead. How have you not seen Shaun of the Dead? It's one every know. weekend. It's good yeah, but I don't, I don't tend to watch TV because my mum is always watching tennis on it. well i i would recommend it it's a very good time yes it's um i've seen the other ones i've seen um hot fuzz hot yeah i adore hot fuzz and the the one with the pubs is very good as well world's end <laughs> yes um, yeah. oh yeah Cake i time. met the production designer of those right off i go Fun. off i go to 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 stick my cake i could have said that in a nicer way yeah oh my god get off me It's cooked! Hooray! I brought some chocolate because I'm jealous that I don't get to eat the cake. Oh, God, that's a good idea. So the letter has been written. 
and the body is equipped. So with the persona and the documents complete, the body is now taken out of its freezer and it's dressed and equipped. The briefcase is packed. Um, <laughs> a grisly detail at this point. His feet were initially too frozen to put the boots on him. So they had to bring in a two bar electric heater and kind of go around his feet until they were thawed out enough to be able to slip the boots on. Um, but that, that eventually passed without a hitch. Um, the body was then inserted into a specially designed canister which was labelled optical instruments um, and bolted shirt in preparation for the journey. Now we'll move on to the journey. Leg one uh, was driving the body from London to Scotland um, along with Chumley and Montague, uh, for which they employed St. John Jock Horseful, great name, who um, is an MI5 chauffeur who was also, just incidentally, the fastest race car driver in the country. And he, moreover, was short-sighted and refused to wear glasses. So the <laughs> incredibly, incredibly important, like vital that nothing happens to this corpse journey was <laughs> the most terrifying thing ever. Um, it's incredibly fast. At one point, um, Jock Horsfall fails to see a roundabout, so he just drives straight over it. <laughs> which is the closest that either Chumley or Montague came to dying in the whole war. Um, but they got through it. Um, and once they get to Scotland's west coast, they board the HMS Seraph, which is waiting to take them to Spain. The HMS Seraph is a submarine. Uh, only the captain, Bill Jewell, knows what his cargo contains. The, cl the crew are all clueless. Um, uh, I specify here... Clueless, more like. We've, hey... Uh, we've been through Spain's situation in the war, but yes, basically there was a reasonable Nazi spy presence there um, because of Franco turning a bit of a blind eye. And Montague had identified Huelma, which was a port on the south coast, as their destination. Because in Huelma lived uh, Adolf Klaus, who was an eminent German spy who watched the coast and passed info onto the waiting U-boat wolf packs, which had cost countless Allied lives. And it was time to play him at his own again. And so, on April 30th, the Seraph surfaces just off the coast of Huelva after a close call with a fishing fleet passing overhead, um, which, like, nothing comes of it, it's fine, but basically they're like, oh, at last, our part in this is over, it's about to be in the hands of fate, and then they're about to go up, and just a fishing fleet passes overhead because they fancy getting the salmon early. Um, so then they surface after, and it's fine. Um, but so they, they come to the surface, they tip the body overboard, uh, they go full astern on the motors to kind of him in the right direction. Um, and from there, uh, it's discovered by the fishermen and we kind of know the story, but I'm going to go into more detail because it's really fun. So, the waiting game begins. The two doctors conducting the autopsy are doing so in the midday heat and the British consul, who is in on the plan, suggests that they call it a day early um, because even though the body has been as well preserved as it can be, experts doing an autopsy generally after some time will start to see signs of, hmm, this body is several months old and has been frozen for several months, as opposed to floating for a couple of weeks in the Mediterranean. And so right, the consul yeah. says, guys, it's hot. It's pretty obvious who this guy is and that he's drowned. Let's call it a day. They go, yeah, good good call and so they rule the death as a drowning which is fab and the body is buried with full military honours in Spain. Sure enough eminent spy Adolf Klaus um, has got wind of a British courier with the mysterious document stuffed briefcase um, off the coast pricks up his ears and to further intrigue him Montague and Chumley begin to send urgent telegrams to the consul who obviously is in on it um, and the telegrams are like Guys, the briefcase has gone missing. Repeat, retrieve the briefcase at any cost. Super, super secret. Oh my God. Like again, they're quite over the prank. Job. It's a prank. I know. Um, but they know that these will be intercepted. They are. And uh, Adolf Klaus swallows the bait. Um, he mobilizes his spy network to get hold of the briefcase. But this is when Spain suddenly decides that it's super, super law-abiding and on the side of the Allies. And it's like, um, actually, this is recovered property. It's not for us to turn it over to you guys. Uh, <laughs> so we're in a situation where the Nazi intelligence in Spain is like, we need, give us the briefcase. And Britain is like, 
yeah, Loki, can you can you give them the briefcase? And Spain is like, no, 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 we are loyal and good. Um, but eventually, the briefcase makes its way to Madrid, um, and Karl Erich Kulenthal, who is the most feared spy in Spain, um, is waiting for it. Nine days after the body is recovered from the water, um, a guy who's um, an inside agent from the Spanish Navy manages to grant Kulenthal access to the documents just for an hour. Um, during which uh, Kulenthal's guys take photos of everything and then replace it exactly as it was before. What they don't know is that back at MI5, when they were packing the case, the agents have placed a single eyelash inside the critical letter so that if the documents then get their way back to them, they will be able to know if they've been read as intended. Um, I could see situations in which the body being in the sea for however long could just lodge the eyelash anyway, but I'm sure they knew what they were doing. They did. Also, the of the war. Mm. an eyelash. I know. I also, yeah. I was like, sure, sure. they not, te- probably not in those days, but could they not then test that for DNA? DNA. DNA. <laughs> DV. Um, DNA. No, I think DNA came in in like the 80s. Fabulous then. Um, well, I guess actually, yeah, good point because otherwise they'd just do a DNA test on, oh, who's this guy? Oh, apparently he's a Welsh yeah. miner, so that's a load of. Um, I'm going to look it up. Okay. Uh, while you look that up, I will continue. So, Kulenthal is ecstatic, obviously, at his findings. As far as he's concerned, he's discovered a plan to invade Greece. He immediately submits them to his superiors. Now, uh, some people are confused as to why Kulenthal was so quick to accept this all as completely true and submit it. Um, but he may have been so hurried because he had a secret of his own, which was that his grandmother was Jewish and he did not want anybody to figure this out. And so it was very important to him to please his superiors and give them no reason to try and dig up anything about his past. Um, you're, <laughs> you're looking, um, I don't really know what's on your mind. Wait, so the guy that's spying for the Nazis, mm. his granny's Jewish. Yeah. Are you just trying to figure Maybe out why an earth would... spy for the Nazis. I know. Um, I don't know why you would, but I don't know why anyone would. Um, Lord knows. Um, but either way, he really needed um, constant approval. And so he sends off this report, which for him will guarantee it. Ha 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 No. Um, anyway, the papers pass cleanly through the checks of German intelligence right up until they land on Hitler's desk. The only person not to be completely convinced by this, it appears, was Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda, um, who voices his misgivings in his private journal, but declines to say anything uh, because well, he that's good. to question Hitler. Yeah, which is fab. But can you imagine being girls and being like, you know, I I'm not to be that guy, that. but you can find my journal entry for like the 10th of June. Um, and it says, I feel like this might be a hoax. But I wonder, like, I'm not trying to excuse Goebbels, mm. bad man, but yeah, I wonder bad, bad whether, I, I'm wondering whether Hitler's cabinet fostered that kind of um, environment where you couldn't really say, hey, you're um, probably believing a lie. Yes, I think that was the case. Um because I feel like if the Fuhrer believes it, then it is the truth. So Hitler himself has been suspicious for a long time of the very close British-Greek relationship, and so he loses no time in acting. Um, and so on May 12th, 1943, the code breakers at Bletchley Park, woohoo, pick up woo-hoo! a German high command message. It says, prepare for an allied attack on Greece. And they all celebrate because Operation Mincemeat has worked. I forgot to tell you what was called Operation Mincemeat. It's literally because so much of it was about corpses and they all had a really morbid sense of humour. So they went, would it be funny if we called it Operation Mincemeat? Uh, But yeah, so this is working. Hitler moves uh, an entire panzer division, which is... Now I listened to this clip a lot of times and I looked up how big a panzer division is. And I think it's 19,000 men with a slim possibility that it's in fact 90,000 men. But I'm going to go with 19 because 90,000 men is just implausible. So I (laughs) didn't hear the thousand part. Not because you didn't say it clearly, but because I didn't want to hear it. And I was like, 19 or 19, neither one of (laughs) those odds. And then I realised. 19 whole men. Um, Yeah. And I was like... (laughs) 
what? Oh, this is yeah. the single most important piece of espionage since the Trojan horse. 19 men were diverted. No, this is <laughs> either way, a lot of men um, from France to Greece um, and many more in the coming days. Torpedo boats and fighter squadrons are redeployed to the Greek coast. Gun emplacements that have been set in place in Sicily since January are moved. The forces defending Greece jump essentially from one division to eight divisions in the next couple of weeks. On July 9th, field, the field marshal in charge of German... The, <laughs> sorry, I started um, noting things down, so I put field marshal in charge German army. The fee... Jesus Christ. <laughs> Gives a lot of pages of crap. The field marshal in charge of the German army dispatches um, a warning that's labelled most immediate and it's picked up by Blatchley Park. It predicts a major attack on Greece. And the next morning, on July 10th, the invasion of Sicily begins. We all know what happens from there. The Allies take Sicily for just over a month. They keep working their way inwards until they reach Berlin. We win the war. Woohoo! And finally, in 1998, the British government add Glyndor Michael's true name to his grave in Spain, bringing a close to the incredible story of Operation Mincemeat. Oh, voila! How cool wow. is that? That is cool. I have a few questions. Go ahead. Question number one. Mm. Um, did they send anyone to Greece? Like, did the Allies send anyone to Greece? I don't yeah. think so, no. So um, when no one turned up, were they not like, oh, wait? No, because, well, they were eventually, obviously. Um, but when news reached the troops in Greece um, and or the higher command that a ton of Allied forces has arrived in Sicily... Um, the initial thought was, oh, well, they said that it would be a diversion. So that's what they want us to do. They want us to panic and run to Sicily. Um, I can only assume that they panicked slightly about quite how many forces constituted a small diversion. Yeah. Um, because it was, you know, like, all of them. But If you were the messenger, you'd be like, yeah, sure, they said that. But it's quite a lot. <laughs> it's it's possibly like, 19 no, no. or 90,000 men in like one thing and then like, a, a lot of others. Yeah. <laughs> Like, okay, but, um, uh, okay, second question. Mm. Could they have done it without the corpse? As in, couldn't they have just dropped a briefcase <laughs> in the sea I... with like a British army seal on it and they could have received it? I think they could have done it. The thing is, I think they did use false documents quite a lot, but that's the thing because it was a very, quite a well-known method of trying to... Right deceive people they the felt like it had to have had... more to it um like i know the when the, when you were talking about pigeons earlier um one of the things that i was going to talk about was something that i only know about incredibly vaguely wherein basically just a ton of pigeons were dispatched in order to be shot down by um enemy forces over france that then said completely contradictory stuff um so i think that's the thing is that standalone correspondence was quite common and okay would have been dismissed more quickly. So whereas the they the Germans would have been like, oh, well, there was a corpse with this. Yeah, so and the, it had a briefcase suggest... that was strapped to it, and this guy is of a rank that would have been entrusted with this information. Okay, next question. Mm. This is my final one. Was the granny okay? I have no idea, I'm afraid. Um, oh. The thing is, I don't know if his granny was alive at the time. I, I think... Oh, okay. I get the impression it was more that he didn't want to reveal his Jewish that. heritage than that he wanted to protect his grandmother. I thought he was just a sweetheart who was doing all of it to protect his granny. <laughs> but no, no so I don't think so. Himself. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, those were all my questions. Brilliant. Well, that's, yeah, that's, to the best of my understanding, Operation Mincemeat, which is just mad and really makes me want to find out more about World War II espionage because it's... <laughs> just so inventive and so weird yeah it is sort of like oh i've got an idea everyone and everyone's like oh okay what is it <laughs> okay well we dress up a corpse and we give him some papers and everyone's like wow yeah that's a really great idea yes let's do that <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Other Martha's podcast, the show where a drama student and a film graduate try to talk about things we have no idea about. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do subscribe to our channel for more. Right, stop recording now. <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs>